Thank you, Joni. So, we've got a lot to talk about this morning and a lot from this panel, so let's get busy. Uh, my job is to put things in context and to talk about uh, the land in Texas and the people that are on this land and to just give you some idea of the most recent trends, what that means for the, for the future and then to just put into context how we think about our population growth, where our population is growing, what implications that has for our largest, most valuable asset in our state, which is our land and the natural resources that are derived from it, and then basically get an idea of how we might think about the future as a group so that we can make sure that we maintain that as our most valuable asset. Basic theme, more people. Um, this is not a surprise to anyone. Um, how do we absorb more people into the 171 million acres that is the state of Texas? So we have 262,000 square miles. That's 171 million acres across the state. Uh, a, a good 95% of that is privately owned farms, ranches, and forest lands. Here's what Texas population has done most recently and what it's projected to do into the future. By 2020, we're gonna enter, the, um, enter 2020 with about 30 million people in the state of Texas. That's up by 10 million from 1997. So over the last approximately two decades and some change, we've increased our population by 10 million. So that's, a, that's about 500 thousand per year, so about half a million per year. About half of that increase is natural increase, so that's more babies being born than people dying. The other half is net immigration, so more people showing up than people leaving. Um, it, so there's some characteristics of that that net immigration that we can talk about that, uh, that change across the state and have some implications for the future. But as you can see, under different scenarios, a no, a no net immigration scenario, um, our population will be a little over 32 million by 2050. If we look at a uh, half migration, immigration of what we've had most recent, in most recent decades, we're gonna end up with about 40 million people. If we continue at the same rate of immigration into the state, from, primarily from other states, um, we're gonna end up with a little over uh, 50 million people by 2050. So what do we do about this? How do we think about this? And how do we make things work within our state so that we still have the most prosperous economy and good quality of life and good health? So we've got this changing Texas. Like I said, we've got 171 million acres, 95% uh, of it private. About 17% of it is developed land. That means that 83% of our state is sure enough rural. And that sure enough rural part of our state has about 10% of our population. Now this has changed quite some bit if you were to rewind to about 100 years ago. In 1910, our population was primarily rural. And we've become primarily urban now. And you can see on the right, the, if, you, if you look at each of those little stick people as a quarter million people, uh, the yellow ones make up the rural population, about 10% of our population that's on 83% of the land. And then that one little red guy up, up there, guy or gal, I can't tell, um, the, the one little red one there uh, is less than 1%, and that's how many landowners we have. So we have 141 million acres of private farms, ranches, and forest lands, and we have about 350,000 landowners that make the decisions as to what happens on that land, which happens to be kind of the hidden backbone of our economy, our prosperity, our way of life. Um, and even those urban areas, like if you 
sit here at the corner of Mockingbird and uh, North Central Expressway, you, you might ask everybody that goes by there what a rural area in Texas has to do with their quality of life. It might not be apparent to them, but it has everything to do with their quality of life, everything to do with, with our economy. We talk about things that are the backbone of economy. The real backbone of our economy are these rural lands. Now let's look at the most recent trends in where population has come from. 86% of our growth over the time period from 1997 until 2017, so that's the time period for which we have the most data during that period. Um, there was, so that's a 48% increase, so that's an increase of almost 10 million people, right? 86% of that growth is in 25 counties. So there's 254 counties in the state of Texas. 10% of those counties have absorbed 86% of this growth. And as you can see, that's primarily in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. That's in the I-35 corridor between uh, basically hubbed by Austin and San Antonio down in the valley. So those areas down in the valley that include um, uh, Harlingen, McAllen, uh, Brownsville, all the way up to the Laredo area, the Webb County, which is the, uh, the other South Texas county over there. And then some population increase in El Paso over there in extreme West Texas. And then that's Lubbock, one of the square counties up there. <coughs> Here's what our population has done as far as its distribution in a percentile perspective with respect to urban population and rural population, just most recently, just over the last five decades, we've gone from uh, a population which, which still had a huge rural component to it in the 1950s to a population of almost 10 to 12 percent rural and the remainder is urban. Now what we, what we end up there with is a divide that's often talked about um, between urban and rural. And it's a divide that we hear um, about when we talk about our state legislature. It's a divide when we talk about culture, when we talk about economies, and just about everything that we talk about within our state. But <clears throat> I'm convinced that we can overcome that divide and figure out how to increase the quality of life for both the urban sector and the rural sector. Okay, let's shift to talk about land for a little while. And um, well, let's you know, go back in time a little bit to 1845 when uh, the Republic of Texas was annexed into the United States. We got to keep our land. So that was one of the unique things that Texas got to do that no other state got to do. Most other states, when they were, when they were annexed into the United States, they basically had to say, okay, here's all, here's all of our public domain, United States, you get to put it in the Bureau of Land Management, you get to make national forests out of it, these kinds of things. Texas didn't do that. We kept it for the benefit of the state. And in fact, we were in debt, so we had to sell some of those lands in New Mexico and elsewhere. That's how they ended up not being part of Texas anymore. Um, so we were the 28th state at the time. We had this wave after wave of settlement that came in that added to the tapestry of the cultures across the state. You know, we added to the Tejano um, uh, uh, culture that was already here, Germans, and then Czechs, and then African Americans, and then uh, Hispanics from elsewhere, and then loads of other people, the Norse communities, and, and things like that throughout the central part of the state that made this rural um, culture that was centered around farming, ranching, and forestry that served as the historical backbone of our economy that our state has depended on. Well, that's getting, uh, that's changing. And that's changing quite a bit as our economy changes in that the proportion of people that are involved in agriculture is a pretty small slice of our population now. Actually, you can look at that as a success story. In order to feed our state, if you were to go back to say 1910, it took the labor of a good 35 to 40 percent of the population in order to feed the state. Now, with the labor of between two and eight percent of our population, we can feed our state. So, on behalf of agriculture, someone can say, you're welcome. 
So here's what, here's what has happened to our land base just over the last, um, just over the last uh, several decades. Land conversion, we've lost 2.2 million acres. That's the big thing to remember. 2.2 million acres in the span of 20 years. Now, it, you can do the math in projecting things forward. If we continue to lose lands at that rate to conversion, we're probably not gonna be a sustainable economy as we move forward. So we've got to figure out how to have our cake and eat it too with a growing population, a burgeoning economy, and a, a demand for those things that private lands can provide us through private land stewardship. You can see up there in green, those are the areas where we've lost those lands completely, completely predictable. The growth areas around Austin, San Antonio, uh, Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex, mainly north up there as you can, as you can see there. Um, around Houston, down in the valley, and then some out towards El Paso. Um, fragmentation is another, uh, is, a, is another symptom of what we're seeing as we're shifting away from uh, land-based economic, uh, economic activities. There's more of a, a fragmentation of some lands into smaller ownerships. So you see this graph on the left-hand side over here. Those ownerships that are less than 100 acres in size across the state tend to be increasing or the amount of acreage that are in ownerships that are less than 100 acres in size. Those that are mid-sized, so mid-sized farms and ranches, the, the traditional bread and butter for the agricultural economy in the state, those family farms, if you will, those have tended to decline over that 20 year period. And then there's some consolidation. On the far right, you see those ranches, that are ranches and farms that are greater than 2,000 acres in size. And so there's been some consolidation. Now there's a geography of where this consolidation and fragmentation has occurred. A lot of the consolidation is in the traditional uh, ranching and large farming communities in the High Plains and in South Texas. The fragmentation is throughout the, uh, the central portion of the state. So we've got some, uh, some geography that's related to the scenario. Okay, let's look at landowners and let's look at some of the changes in landowners. Now remember, that was just that one red stick figure that we're looking at. And we're gonna, we're gonna rely on some data here that was put together by the Natural Resources Institute at Texas A&M. In fact, all of these data that I'm showing you here, it's not my data, it's the data that comes from the Natural Resources Institute at Texas A&M, led by Roel Lopez. And it's good data, I can vouch for it. If you look at uh, landowner demographics from some of the surveys that they've done, um, in 1997, the average landowner was 56 years old. Now you look at the changes in landowners and, and this type of stuff over that 20 year period, and the average landowner is now 60 years old. Going forward, that is projected to continue to get older. Um, what we're gonna find is that during the next two decades, the next 20 years, we will have the largest intergenerational transfer of land in the history of our state. That will be a transfer that's just demographically driven. And that always results in some both opportunity and some challenges as we face how we're going to um, work with private lands across our state. So here's, uh, here's the results of a survey looking at landowners that are either 40 years old and older or 40 years old and younger. Those landowners that were 40 years old and older, when they're asked, are you gonna transfer land to a family or loved one over the next 10 years, more than 50% of them said it was either somewhat likely or very likely. Now it makes some common sense that if they're younger, that's a smaller percentage, right? But what this drives home is, is basically that we can, we can realize not only the demographics are gonna indicate that there's a change, but there's an intention in the mind of these landowners that yes, they are gonna transfer that land. And Many of you know what happens when you go from one generation to the next generation in the transfer of land. There's, you know, things can go one way or the other if we can create an atmosphere that is profitable, economically advantageous, and, and 
something that encourages private land stewardship, I think we can make this transition to our advantage. So, our future Texas landowner, they're going to be younger, right? They're going to be more well uh, technologied, if that's a word. Is technology the word? I don't think so. But uh, the goals and objectives um, are going to be the same. Uh, new ownerships. There's going to be large proportions of absentee ownership. So when we talk about a divide between rural and urban Texans, that divide is not just amongst the, the entire state. There's going to be uh, this, a similar divide amongst our landowners. So 40% of our landowners, so 40% of the land base will be, will be owned, controlled, and somewhat managed by absentee landowners. Now that's neither good nor bad, that's just simply context, and that's something that we're gonna have to adapt to as we put together conservation programs and these types of things. So, how do we think about this and what do we think about? My time's running short here. I'm just gonna give you some final thoughts. Uh, it's too easy to simply conclude that our state's becoming more divided, particularly along rural and urban lines. So we need, to, we need to assure that leaders understand that the destiny of our state's economy is equally linked to the health of our rural and urban areas, and we've got to figure that out. Uh, the idea of land stewardship, the idea of private land stewardship being an organizing concept that we think of whether we're an urban, dweller or a rural dweller, we're going to have to blur the lines there and begin to think about that as a responsibility that, that we have basically as a citizen of the state. I'm going to be done and pass it off to uh, the next person on our, on our panel. So thank you so much.